Well, if you would, turn back with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 13. We've already read our passage for this morning. A sermon preached by the Apostle Paul, the first recorded by the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts thus far. A sermon which we might entitle, History That Sets You Free. History That Sets You Free. Probably all of us are familiar with Jesus' famous saying, the truth will set you free. And certainly what we find here are truths that set free. With that word freed pops up at the end of our passage, verse 39, the gospel of Jesus will free you from everything that the law of Moses couldn't free you from. But it's not just truth here that sets us free. This is a specific kind of truth. It's truth rooted in events, in history. It's history that sets you free. Now, before we dig deeper into Paul's sermon and try to understand it and apply it. Let's remember where we are in the flow in development of the book of Acts, because the book of Acts, we're taking it scene by scene, week to week in our study of it, but it's, it's a story, right? It's, it has a bigger picture story. These scenes, one by one, really do connect to each other, and we should remember from time to time to zoom out. So let me actually literally zoom out with Google Earth and show you a map. Let's look on the screens for a map here as a way of uh, reminding ourselves what's come already in the book of Acts and where we are now. Remember, this thing started in Jerusalem back in Acts 1, and the gospel spread there. And then, because of persecution, it spread a little bit to the south, but mostly to the north, into Samaria. Samaria's a little under Galilee there. And because of persecution, the gospel continued to spread north all the way up to Antioch. That was chapter 11. But we saw last week at the beginning of chapter 13 that the church in Antioch sent out Paul and Barnabas on mission to take the gospel where the gospel was not yet known. And the first place they went was this island of Cyprus. And so you can see they move from the east side of the island to the west side. They go into synagogues. And no doubt they will preach the gospel wherever they go, not just to the Jews in the synagogues, but, but to whoever will listen and wherever they go. So now we pick up chapter 13, verse 13, our passage for today. And there are some new cities with names we don't recognize, I'm sure. That's why the map is out. From Paphos at the end of Cyprus, they sailed north to Pamphylia and Perga. And from there, they traveled even more north to Antioch in Pisidia. Yes, there are multiple Antiochs in the Bible. You notice there are two on the screen right now. There were actually about 12 Antiochs at this time. That is 12 cities named after Antiochus. So our passage has Paul today in Antioch, in Pisidia. And we might wonder why he would go there. And we don't know. We don't know exactly. He might have, maybe we might think, more easily gone to a port city. Sometimes Paul seems to favor port cities. He sure did through, through his work in Cyprus. But he goes deep inland, about 100 miles inland to Antioch in Pisidia, over mountains, these Taurus mountains that you really can't tell are there in our picture and our map, but they're there. And they're, they were famous for being treacherous terrain and dangerous because of villains and bandits and thieves and all that. Paul goes deep in with the gospel. We're not sure why, and we're not sure exactly why John Mark didn't go. Well, we heard last week that John Mark went with Paul and Barnabas. He was a helper, we were told. That was chapter 13, verse, let me find it, verse 5. Here this week, verse 13, we're just simply told he left them and went back home to Jerusalem. And we're not told why. We'll find out in chapter 15 that Paul's a little upset about it. And when John Mark wants to go with them on another missions trip, Paul says, uh-uh, because of what happened back here. We don't know why John Mark didn't go, but these are, these are the markers. This is the setting in which we find 
the gospel going forth in the Mediterranean area. And today we see it starting to spread in this little place, Antioch, in Pisidia. Paul and Barnabas go to a synagogue. Think of it as kind of a Jewish church. It's a place where prayers would be made, the Bible would be read, and someone would give some sort of word of encouragement or exhortation about that passage read. And perhaps because Paul was a, a former Pharisee, perhaps because this church hadn't heard that he's no longer really among the Pharisees but a Christian, he's invited to teach. Verse 15, do you have a word of encouragement for us? Now, just hit pause before we see what Paul does. What would you do? What would you do in this context? You have a lot in common with these people. There are a lot of things that you could say here that are true, that are encouraging, and are safe. You could talk about the law. You could talk about the Psalms. You could talk about Old Testament history and leave it at that and no one's mad and no one's saved. And so he doesn't just stick to what is common, agreed upon information. He moves from there to the crux of the matter. He starts with Bible facts, yes, no controversy there, but he shows that they move to this point and this person, and he preaches it to them. His sermon falls along these lines. The flow of God's plan, the fulfillment of that plan in God's man, the forgiveness that's needed, and the faith that is required. So first, there's the flow of God's plan as Paul references about a dozen Old Testament events and people and eras. His point is to show that God's plan is going somewhere, that there is a flow to it. Though we read in the Old Testament of hundreds of different stories, or we find ourselves in Bible reading in different epics or eras of Bible history, it's all going somewhere. They have some things in common, even though they're in different places with different characters. The Bible's stories, Paul insists, are about God doing his thing. It's his power, it's his plan, he's orchestrating it, and he is so gracious all along the way. Those are the two things he emphasizes as he works through a dozen different events or peoples or eras. Like verse 17, God chose our fathers. That's gracious. That's his doing. This happens in Genesis 12 to 50 in our Bibles, where four generations in one family are given these enormous promises that God will turn them into a great nation that will bless the world and from them will come a seed or a son, a ruler, to whom the obedience of the nations will go. Big promises. He chose our fathers. And then he made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. That's the book of Exodus. Though God's people were slaves in Egypt, God multiplied them there, and he didn't keep them there. And so he led them out. With an uplifted arm, he led them out. Again, you see, God did it. God is the subject with all of these verbs and all of the action that takes place. It's by his power. It's because he's kind and gracious. It's even really remarkable that he put up with them in the wilderness, it says. That's Exodus to Deuteronomy. For 40 years, God was with his people and remained with his people and continued to reveal his glory despite their stubborn sin and complaints. He put up with them. But after that, he destroyed seven nations as he led them into the land that was first promised to that, to that family of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Judah. The land eventually became the people's land. And this is in the days of Joshua. This is in the book of Joshua. 
After the book of Joshua comes the book of Judges, and that's what Paul mentions next. He gave them judges. Judges were like these superhero warriors who would rescue God's people whenever they found themselves in a pickle that they put themselves in. They'd rebel, God would bring trouble upon them, they'd call out for help, and God would provide help through these judges. He had judges as part of his plan until Samuel the prophet. This is the book of 1 Samuel. He's the prophet, a godly good prophet. It's during the days of Samuel that the people of Israel ask for a king. That's putting it mildly. They actually demanded to have a king, a king that would replace God as their king. And so God gave them what they want. He gave them King Saul. It was rather disastrous, but not finally so, because God eventually removed Saul and then raised up David, it says, verse 22. Raised up David to be their king. And that's really where the survey starts as far as the Old Testament goes. David's a big deal in God's plan. And so we can understand why Paul would stop there as maybe like a springboard for what's next. David was in many ways the fulfillment of many promises that came before King David. And King David was given larger promises than anything that came before Promises which ring out into eternity and run straight through Jesus. So in verse 23, here's the springboard. Paul skips a thousand years of Old Testament history to launch from David to Jesus. Of this man, David's offspring, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus, just as he promised. Now, there are a couple of words in verse 23 that should stand out. Promise and offspring. If you've been a Bible student for some time, you might think of 2 Samuel 7. When you hear offspring of David and promises. So in 2 Samuel 7, here we have one of those enlarged promises given to David and his people and his line and his kingdom where God says, I will raise up your offspring after you. I will establish the throne of your kingdom or his kingdom forever, you and your sons, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. God promised David a kingdom that would last forever. As history proved, it wouldn't happen by God providing an unending succession of Davidic kings, father to son, father to son, father to son, on and on it goes. No, instead, God's plan was that one eternal son of David would one day come and occupy this throne eternally. Not in Jerusalem alone, but everywhere all over the world, it would be an eternal global reign. And Paul says, that's Jesus. Now, before he moves forward, he takes one small step backwards from Jesus in the timeline. And he talks about John the Baptist, because before Jesus came, John the Baptist was the greatest among men. Jesus said so himself. But John the Baptist, even the greatest of the Israelites at that time, he said, I'm not the one. In fact, the one who is to come, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. Jesus is that one. He's the one, the promised one. So God's plan has a flow to it. It's not merely a collection of sayings and stories and scenes and characters and speeches. This is all going somewhere. And we should grow in knowing that. You might feel like this is someone else's history. I'm a Christian. I came in with the Jesus thing. And that stuff that's before, it's interesting for some people, but you don't really need it. But the Apostle Paul, when he, when he was teaching new Christians who didn't have this in their past, 
He taught them like it was their past. He taught them this history and taught them to buy in as these, as their stories, and this as their, is, is their Bible. So we got to know it. You might find it very difficult to keep straight what happens in what order. And really, our Bibles don't always help us with this. Nehemiah is somewhere in the middle of the Old Testament before Psalms, and it happens way at the end of the Old Testament. What? When I first heard that, I was really mad. What? i got to get me a different Bible then. Uh, but, but once we learn these things, we are a little more equipped to see how the pieces fit together. You know, if you have kids in your home, or if you don't, there is a great resource you should have written by my friend David Helm. It is the Big Picture Story Bible. It has all kinds of cartoons which will make you feel very youthful and childlike and, and maybe even not so smart because you're reading a kid's book. But it masterfully pieces together the stories of the Bible to show how this thing flows and it flows right through Jesus. A side note here. Doesn't that mean that God's plan isn't primarily about you. It's his story. His man is Jesus. Jesus is at the center of it all. Your plan, your story is really his story. I know you like to think of your story with you at the center of it. We all do. We imagine ourselves in a, in a movie or something, and we're always the main character. Everyone else plays a secondary role. But but here's the thing, God is the main character, this is his plan, this is his story, and we'd be much better helped if we imagined ourselves in our story as part of his story. It's his story, and Christ is at the center of it all. So secondly, we've already talked about it basically, but now it gets explicit. The fulfillment in God's man, Jesus. Paul already referred to Jesus in verse 23, but in verse 26 and following, he's going to get more explicit that Jesus is the fulfillment. He is God's man. He's not just God's man. He's also the God man, but, but it's fair to say he's the one. He's the servant. He's the expected one, the Messiah. He's our salvation. Paul called him Savior in verse 23. And then in verse 26, he says, this is the message of salvation. We think of what the angel told Mary before Jesus' birth. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. And how will he do it? Mary surely didn't know right then when she heard the angel announce that name. But we now can know. And Paul knows it's through Jesus' death and resurrection that Jesus is Savior and brings a message of salvation. And so Paul has to unpack this thing of the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Of course he has to unpack it, explain it, anticipate some questions there from among the hearers in the synagogue. You can imagine them wondering, well, if this Jesus is the promised son of David, then why was he murdered by the Romans? Or if Jesus really is the long-awaited Messiah, why didn't our religious leaders recognize him as such? And so verse 27, Paul essentially answers those questions. Well, those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers at the time of Jesus' trial... They didn't recognize him because they didn't understand the utterances of the prophets despite the fact that they heard those prophets read every single Sabbath. No, instead, they, they didn't quite get what Messiah was to be. They understood the prophets talking about one to come who's going to be the king, who's going to be majestic, Mighty, powerful, a rescuer. 
they overlooked other parts of the prophets, that this one also would be a suffering servant, a sacrifice for sin, a rejected one. And so Jesus didn't look like the real one, and they actually ironically fulfilled the very prophecies that they overlooked then by rejecting him and by killing him. But Jesus' death wasn't unfortunate. It was God's plan. Their rejection of Jesus leading to the cross was sad. It was sinful. They weren't blamable or responsible for it. But, but it was God's plan. They were fulfilling what God had foretold all along in the Bible. That salvation for God's people would come through his son's suffering. And he suffered on a tree, we're told. Paul uses that word, not cross, not crucifixion. He uses this word tree. They took him down from the tree. Why tree? Because his hearers would have known about Deuteronomy 21. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So succinctly with just one word, Paul gets them thinking, I'm sure. What do you mean? He was hung on a tree. Was he cursed? Cursed, but not because he deserved it, but because he was bearing another's curse, bearing our curse. As Paul will later write to the Galatians, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. That's why it was written long ago, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That's why he uses the word tree here. He wants them to understand Jesus was a curse for us. Not because he was cursed. He had no guilt. He wasn't worthy of death. It was all according to plan. God's gracious saving plan. How do we know that this was God's plan? Well, you can look back to the Old Testament and see it foretold. But you can also look ahead of the crucifixion. Fast forward just a, a few days. The resurrection. Verse 30. God raised him from the dead. And how do we know that, Paul? Well, verse 31, because he appeared to many, and they are now witnesses for him of his resurrection. And so now, verse 32, we bring to you the good news of what God has promised long ago. It's fulfilled now in the resurrection of Jesus. Not convinced yet? Well, then Paul digs deeper in the Old Testament. He gives us three Old Testament quotations that are worth picking apart a little bit to see what he's doing and what they mean for his audience and for us. So he quotes from Psalm 2. There, a psalm written about David. The second psalm says, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. This leans upon 2 Samuel 7 and the promises given to David there. There it said David and his sons would be sons of God. David was made a son of God where he was beloved and reigning with God. He was prince over Israel under God. Now, that had some relevance for David. It was true for David, but it is spectacularly more true of David's greater son who comes a thousand years later, Jesus. Jesus never had a today when he was begotten like David did. David was called a son one day. Jesus has been eternally begotten, the theologians tell us. That is, he has always been the son. He is the son par excellence. He is the son to the max and always has been. And so we speak of Jesus not as begotten in his resurrection or begotten in his birth. No, that word, begotten, yeah, give birth to, can also mean one and only and Jesus is that for sure. He's the one and only son in an unparalleled way. His birth, 
where he was called the Son, his baptism where he was called the Son, his transfiguration where he was called the Son, and also in his resurrection, all these simply declared and demonstrated that Jesus has always been the Son. You are my Son. The second quote of the Old Testament is from Isaiah 55. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Now this too leans on 2 Samuel 7 and the promises there. That's the blessing that comes from David. But you fast forward from the time of David to the time of Isaiah. Isaiah is written in a time when God's people are about to be taken away into slavery in Babylon. And there's about to be no king in Israel. Remember, there are big promises for a king of Israel to come, 2 Samuel 7 and elsewhere. What do you do when you find yourself in Babylonian captivity? The temple and the palace are destroyed, and there's no king on the throne when God said, the throne will be eternal. Well, you find comfort in what God says here. I will give you all the holy and sure blessings of David. Isaiah's message was mostly judgment and trouble, at least for the first 39 chapters of his prophecy. At chapter 40, it takes a turn and it starts talking about salvation and comfort that's coming for God's people. And it keeps going along that way until you start hearing about God's servant who's going to come and bring this comfort and, and, and be salvation for God's people. You get to the famous Isaiah chapter 53, and we read there that this servant will pay for sins at great cost. He'll be beaten and stricken. Guilt will be laid on him. We'll go a little bit further into chapter 55, and we're told that the, the doors are wide open. Come. You who thirst, you who are hungry, come. Buy without money, without price. Everyone can come in through the sacrifice of this suffering servant who cleanses sin. Anyone can come, and I will give you all the holy and sure blessings of David. Now, do you get what's happening here? I will give you Israel. It's plural in both Old Testament and New. I will give you all, you people, will get the blessings of David because of the sacrifice of the suffering servant. We could say today, through Jesus, the blessings that were promised to King David flow to all who come to the true king. Now, a third Old Testament quote from Psalm 16. There David wrote, you will not let your Holy One see corruption. On the first level, David writes this about himself. He writes it about God's temporary protection of David. I say temporary because eventually David died. It can be said and it can be true of David for a time you didn't let your Holy One see corruption. How many potential pitfalls and threats did God protect David from in all his wars and in all his hiding from Saul who was after him for so long? Yes, you will not let your Holy One see corruption. But, but it says too much, doesn't it? David wrote better than he knew. He laid out for himself some shoes that were far too big for him to fill. And so Paul knows exactly what David was doing, or at least what God was doing in the writing of David. David laid down with his fathers and saw corruption, but he whom God raised didn't see corruption. Jesus died and was buried, but he was raised Therefore, he defeated death. Therefore, he's the one that David really was writing about in Psalm 16 and in Psalm 2 and elsewhere. Jesus defeats death. So, verse 38, let it be known to you, therefore, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. 
So now we come thirdly, the forgiveness that is needed. Paul's point is not just that the stories of the Bible were all going somewhere. His point is not simply that Jesus is the solution, the answer, the the fulfillment of all those promises of old. His point is not simply that Jesus is the king and all the promises of David get funneled into him. All that's true. All that has been said, yes. But what's the point? What's the value? What does it mean for me? Through this man, in this man alone, comes the forgiveness of sins. And Paul was proclaiming it to them that day, a message of forgiveness. This tells us that Jesus came to address this problem, forgiveness from sin because of guilt. He came to address the biggest problem. You want to know what your greatest need is? Let Jesus define it for you. He came to be a ransom for sin, a payment for sin that you might be forgiven because you, like me, have guilt by nature. But you can be freed. Verse 39, you can be freed from everything from which the law of Moses couldn't free you from. You can be freed from everything. This is, this is history that sets you free. It's history that justifies That's actually a better word here. Freed, it can be translated justified, maybe should. It's that technical term, which is a legal term. It means to be declared righteous. Declared righteous. Picture a courtroom scene, and you're you're the one for whom they are about to announce the verdict. God is about to announce this verdict. What will it be? By nature, on your own, left to yourself, the verdict is guilty, condemned, eternal punishment. That's the case for all of us. But on account of Christ's righteousness and death and resurrection, you can be pronounced not only innocent, but righteous. Imagine that courtroom where they don't say, we can't prove it, so you can go. They don't say, "Eh, innocent, you probably didn't do it. But imagine a courtroom where the judge says, you've been perfect. Now, why would the judge ever do that? It's not because you have been perfect. It's simply and only because Christ has been perfect for you. Remember the tree. He bore the curse for us on the tree. That means we don't get the curse. We get all the blessing. The law can't save you like this. I don't mean the Albuquerque law or any kind of national law. I mean the Old Testament law or any kind of moral standard that you set up for yourself, it can't save you. It can expose to you your need for a savior. That's what the Old Testament law was for. It kept showing Israel failure, failure, failure in trouble. And when you feel that in your bones, the guilt, the weight, and the inability to achieve success with God's law, then you're ready to hear about Christ bearing a curse for you. The law can't do it. John Bunyan, who wrote that that great old classic, Pilgrim's Progress, he wrote also some, some great poetic lines that go like this. Run, John, run, the law commands, but gives you neither feet nor hands. Far better news the gospel brings. It bids you fly and gives you wings. The gospel not only forgives, but it empowers. It changes. And so we trust in Christ and in Christ alone. Trust is another word for faith. And so lastly, the faith that is required. Everyone who believes is freed from everything. 
Isn't that incredible? Full forgiveness for past, present, and future sins on account of faith in Jesus, in Jesus alone. Do you believe it? I mean, what marvelous grace. Let's be astounded by it again. Whether you've heard it for the first time this morning or the 1,000th or 10,000th time this morning, it matters not. Let this amaze you and enthrall you. You can have all your sins forgiven and you can be justified. You can be called righteous by God, not because you've done anything to earn it, but simply because Jesus was righteous for you and he died for you and he's risen so you know it's true. You can put all your eggs in this basket. That same John Bunyan wrote about his conversion or what might have been a a fresh awareness of assurance after his conversion. It matters not. But he wrote about it like this. One day I was passing in the field and suddenly this sentence fell upon my soul. Thy righteousness is in heaven. And I thought that I could see Jesus Christ at God's right hand. Yes, there indeed was my righteousness, so that whatever I was and whatever I was doing, God could not say about me that I did not have righteousness, for it was standing there before him. I also saw that it was not my good feelings that made my righteousness better, and that my bad feelings did not make my righteousness worse. For my righteousness was Christ Jesus himself, who's the same yesterday, today, and forever." Now indeed the chains fell off my legs and I was loosened from my afflictions. I went home rejoicing because of the grace and the love of God. There was nothing but Christ before my eyes. This is what faith looks like. Looking outside yourself and looking to Christ in Christ alone. Everyone who believes no matter your past, no matter how bad it is, no matter what you've done. Everyone who believes is justified. They are freed from everything, from every sin, from every guilt. Believe it. Or heed this warning. Paul goes on to warn. Verse 40, beware therefore, lest what is said in the prophets, specifically Habakkuk 1.5. You don't want this to come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe even if one tells it to you. In the days of Habakkuk, God's people couldn't comprehend. They didn't believe what they'd been told by God through the prophet that God was going to use the wicked Babylonians to discipline his people, Israel. They couldn't believe it. They wouldn't go there. They couldn't comprehend, even though they were told. And Paul is warning his hearers of the same thing. Something even more astonishing than that has been told them, that Christ, the Messiah, the King, God in the flesh has come and he has taken on poverty and suffering in our place for our sins. The problem was within you, not outside you. He came to fix you, not everything else around you. And that's what you need. And he did it. He did it through this thing that every kind of culture thought was a a cursed thing, crucifixion. To be saved by way of crucifixion? Well, that's that's foolishness to Gentiles. That's a, a stumbling block to Jews. Or it's the power of God into salvation. And we know it's the power of God into salvation because God raised him from the dead. A rubber stamp from God himself that all that he said was true and all that he did worked. Christian, keep on believing. Continue in the grace of God. 
That's what Paul will say later on. We'll see it next week. Some people will believe, and he will urge them to continue in the grace of God. Now, that doesn't mean they can lose the grace of God. It means you keep believing. Like the great journey song says, don't stop believing. They wrote better than they knew. Continue in the grace of God. The gospel, you should know, is still for Christians. Christians need to hear the gospel routinely because they still have sin and because they still feel guilt. The gospel is for Christians. This is all over our Bibles. Like in Romans where Paul tells the Romans he can't wait to get to Rome to preach the gospel to them. Roman Christians. Or when Paul writes to the Colossians and, and celebrates how the gospel was bearing fruit among them. It was overflowing in life. Or when Paul leaves the Ephesian church later on in Acts and he commends them to the grace of God which is able to build them up. The gospel works and it saves and it changes. Tim Keller a former pastor now in New York City. He wrote this, we never get beyond the gospel in our Christian life to something more advanced. The gospel is not the first step in a stairway of truths. Rather, it's more like the hub in a wheel of truth. The gospel is not just the ABCs of Christianity, it's the A to Z of Christianity. The gospel is not just the minimum required doctrine necessary to enter the kingdom, but the way we all make progress in the kingdom. We're not justified by the gospel and then sanctified by obedience, but the gospel is the way we grow. It is the solution to each problem, the key to each closed door, the power through every barrier. It's very common in the church to think the gospel's for non Christians because one, one needs to be saved. But once saved, you grow through hard work and obedience. But this is a mistake. All our problems, even as Christians, come from a failure to apply the gospel. That is a good and fitting word. Let me end quickly with five summary takeaways for us as Christians. Number one, let us continue to marvel at and rejoice in so great a salvation and in so great a Savior. Let us never get used to the gospel. Let us never tire from hearing it. Let us never move past the beauty and the simplicity of the gospel as if we could move on to something better. Let's continue to rehearse who Jesus is and what he did and what he did for us and what it means for us. Secondly, let us continue to study his marvelous plan through his wonderful book, the Bible. Let's get better at better, at better and better at, at seeing Jesus rightly in the pages of Scripture. Let us love finding him and seeing him and beholding him. Remember those two men on the road to Emmaus when Jesus explained to them how the whole Old Testament was all about him, and he unpacked that for who knows how long. They said, didn't our hearts burn within us when he told us all that? Oh, when's the last time you had good Bible study heartburn? <laughs> you need more of it, maybe. Thirdly, let's get to Jesus. A new phrase maybe for you, get to Jesus. Let's get to Jesus with non-Christians as soon as is reasonably possible. The Apostle Paul here shows us a model of evangelism, which he doesn't always do in Acts chapter 17 when he's talking to people who have no idea what the Old Testament says. He doesn't start with Old Testament stories. But, but you can. D.A. Carson does a lot of college outreach and he almost always has about seven messages that he uses with unbelieving college students that simply walk through the progression of the Bible to show how it all leads to Christ. But here's the point. Get to Christ. Get to Christ. The answer isn't in Old Testament morals. The answer isn't in 
wisdom, sayings of Proverbs? The answer is in Jesus Christ. Notice that Paul here doesn't aim his message primarily at felt needs or life improvement. This is a substantial theological, biblical declaration about Jesus as Savior for this problem, the forgiveness of sins. We could learn from that. Fourth, let us fully embrace the reality that all this is God's plan and Christ is in the spotlight, not you, not me. And we don't need to jockey for position or, or spotlight. Our story is his story. Let us fully embrace that reality. And lastly, let us forever give great thanks and praise to Jesus simply because he's the one, he's the king, he is the centerpiece of God's plan, he is God's plan, he is God. And one day we, if we're his, if we believe this gospel and we've been freed from our sins, we will join him and we will passionately forever give him great, thoughtful, passionate worship with the gospel and what he's done upon the cross as the centerpiece of it all. And we will never tire of it. Let's give him great praise. Would you bow with me? Oh, Lord Jesus, you indeed are the, as we'll sing in just a moment, the matchless king. You are lamb upon the throne. You are Lord of life and Lord of peace. And so we give you praise this morning for all that you've done, for all that you are. We ask for your help to look into your word better. We ask, Lord, for your help to talk of the gospel more boldly and clearly. We ask for your help, Lord Jesus, to continue to marvel at your salvation. We thank you that you, the Redeemer and the King, has died for us. We pray, Lord, that that would spread even here this morning with some in this room perhaps coming to believe it for the very first time today. Would you give faith? Would you open eyes to see? Would you help people here, Lord, to get past the blindness and hard-heartedness of sin and see hope that is only in you? But my, what great hope it is. And so we give you praise. Amen.